bit. Uh, mostly Ben. Steve's here for uh, support, <laughs> moral support. Um, ben comes from a, a, a DMR or a digital mobile uh, Motorola Turbo, Moto Turbo background. I just murdered all those words. Um, and uh, Steve sponsors and hosts the uh, uh, area's M3, N3 QEM uh, DMR repeater systems in Vienna and Herndon and Alexander? Arlington. Arlington. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Ben, and uh, I guess that's it. Take it away. Um, so in comparison to uh, analog FM uh, communications, uh, digital voice, uh, the, the first thing that happens when you transmit on a DMR radio is your, your voice is digitized. Uh, by an analog to digital converter, and it's vo and it's vocoded into uh, to, for compression. And at that point, your your bits and bytes going over the air until you come out of a speaker on the other end. Um, uh, it's uh, the, the vocoder is optimized for human voice, and it uh, breaks down your uh, your continuous voice stream into uh, smaller packets to be sent over the air. Um, this is a this is a small diagram from QST in, two, in 2015. They had an article introducing some of the digital voice modes. Um, kind of goes through the uh, the basic uh, the basic path. Um, your audio is uh, digitized, as I mentioned, goes through a vocoder. Some framing bits are added and other messaging. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. And then uh, it's modulated and then hits the antenna. So and then from there it's radio. So uh, DMR radio is. Uh, um, is uh, again, it's uh, digitized voice and data, and you can uh, uh, you can use it any you can use the same antennas and speaker microphones and, and other things that you're used to seeing uh, on radio. So tonight I'm uh, here. Uh, I've got a little slide a little bit later about some other digital voice modes, but tonight we're going to talk about digital mobile radio. Um, so DMR is an open standard produced by uh, um, produced by the e uh, ETSI ETSI, which is the European Telecommunications Standard Institute. Uh, it's similar to the organization, the international organization that makes uh, APCO 25. So uh, it's, it's also, ETSI is also the organization that creates, that created Tetra, which you may have heard of, which is what most of the world uses is, uh, when they're not using P25 radio systems. There's three tiers of, of DMR uh, set out in the standard. Um, tier one are unlicensed digital radio, and you can think of those like FRS or GMRS radios. And in Europe, they actually use 446 megahertz, and that causes problems when people bring their radios here. Um, licensed conventional radio systems are uh, tier two, and that's what just about all communi uh, DMR communications these days in the US are. And tier three is more advanced uh, trunking systems. Um, and uh, again, that's based, on, uh, that's based on the standard trunking system. Or you may hear of other tr um, other systems that are more manufacturer specific trunking like systems. Um, DMR is not vendor specific. There are many manufacturers of, of radios, and they've all gotten together and formed an organization called the uh, DMR Association. So um, radios are available from many different manufacturers, uh, and some some names you've probably heard of before. And some you, I, I promise you haven't. Um, so the DMR standard defines the common air interface for radio interoperability. So the standard puts out and says, or it documents uh, what, what goes, goes out over the air, um, how you get there to the antenna, and how you get from the antenna out to the speaker. Um, a lot of the value-added features and other things uh, are considered data messages that are included, at which, which there's space for, and that's where the manufacturers often take, uh, um, uh, take, their, take and run with that and add, uh, and add other digital features to it, uh, data features. Um, DMR occupies uh, 12 and a half kilohertz occupied channel bandwidth, and it uses TDMA, which is different uh, than what most most amateur radio and other uh, communication systems, probably until that point, were when we're talking about conventional radio. Um, modulation is 4 FSK, and uh, uh, system was designed around frequencies between 30 megahertz and 1 gigahertz. So commercially available equipment covers VHF, UHF, 700, 800, and 900 megahertz. Um, and then I separated this last bullet because um, the vocoder that's used is not actually part of the standard. The DMR association members got together and decided to use the uh, AMBE2 vocoder. And uh, that's caused, that, that's, if you've been following DMR or some of the digital voice modes, that's something that's caused some contention in the amateur community because that's actually a proprietary uh, patented vocoder. And the only way to use it is to go to the inventor, uh, DVSI, Digital Voice Systems, and pay them about $100 for every radio, either to get a chip 
or to get the license to use the software implementation of it. Um, so it's important to note that that's not that's not part of the standard, but the uh, but in order to operate on DMR, your radio has that somewhere in it. So next, I wanted to talk a little bit about time slots and TDMA. Um, you may be you're, you're, everybody here is familiar with operating a radio by tuning uh, by tuning to a different channel by changing the frequency. Uh, that's called frequency division multiple access. And traditional amateur repeaters, you tune. We, we refer to our local repeaters by their frequency in 25 kilohertz steps. Um, we actually currently use wideband uh, FM for most things, and uh, and that takes up a 25 kilohertz of spectrum to carry a single voice half duplex conversation. Um, however, uh, one a newer, <coughs> a different way to divide channels up is in time. So. While frequency division multiple access, if you uh, this axis is frequency, and this is energy, and the signal and, and time progresses in that direction, two different repeaters are next to each other. And if you have a pan adapter or a spectrum analyzer or an SDR, you've probably seen something like this. It looks like a waterfall and goes in that direction. Two channels talking next to each other. Um, TDMA accomplishes the two time slots by occupying the same bandwidth, but actually slotting the uh, transmissions into 30 millisecond slots. So it can carry two conversations in the space that was previously occupied by a single conversation. And furthermore, uh, since, since I mentioned DMR is 12 and a half kilohertz wide RF signal, uh, you, can, you could take the spectrum of a 25 kilohertz wideband FM repeater and effectively have four half duplex talk paths going through the same uh, occupied bandwidth. So there's a few differences between DMR and um, DMR and analog. Um, now, some of these are, are specific to DMR. Most of them are general to digital voice. Um, the first I mentioned is two sim simultaneous conversations on a repeater. Um, uh, your subscriber radio, your portable radio, transmits uh, in one of those time slots all of the time, uh, while leaving the other open for another user to operate on a different channel, even through the same repeater. The repeaters provide the time sync to keep everybody at 30 millisecond spacing um, through, the, through the system. And this, as I mentioned, provides uh, more efficient spectrum utilization. DMR uh, off also offers improved audio performance. And before everybody <laughs> comes at me, I put a star there because a lot of people aren't quite comfortable with the way digital voice sounds yet. But everything's going digital, including our cell phones and our televisions. and. Um, the technology is always improving. I, um, I worked. I worked at Motorola when the when the uh, when they came out with a, a pretty big update to the AME the, the vocoder settings, and everybody's voice came into the clear overnight when you updated your radio. So that's the cool thing about software-defined radio and DSP. Things can be tweaked without having to open the back and make adjustments with uh, with screwdrivers and things like that. Um, so digital voice uh, retains better quality as signal strength diminishes. So this is one. Uh, one way that, it, that it's better. And this plot sort of sh sort of shows that. Um, obviously, it's digital. Think about it like your television when we when we all had digital television. We had uh, we had analog, and if your antenna got misaligned or the wind was blowing, and the snow or static would come up over the signal. Um, and now, when that happens, it generally stays there, and if the signal level de decreases below the threshold that's detect or that's uh, acceptable, you'll start to see pixelization. So. Some people call it pixelization of voice as, uh, as audio diminishes or as the signal level diminishes. So there's no noise burst or static, and uh, <coughs> instead, instead uh, those bit errors occur. So uh, when you think about perhaps an analog signal as someone drives straight away from a repeater, um, eventually their signal level drops to the minimum acceptable audio quality pretty linearly and falls into, you know, starts to fall apart and it's a little bit harder to understand what the person's saying. Whereas digital mobile radio, as, as like digital television and others, um, uh, the audio quality remains pretty consistent for a longer period of time, and then it drops off more sharply. Um, I'm going to try to play this video and see if, it, uh, see if we can hear it. Um, yeah, it's not going to come out very well with this group because I don't have speakers. <clears throat> the, uh, the as the signal strength diminishes, uh, as the si signal strength diminishes, the audio quality diminishes, and in a digital mode, it, it tends to stay uh, stay a better signal for longer and then drops off more quickly. Yes? Is the signal degradation um, the same as analog model or depending on the distance? It's 
radio, yes. It's, it's radio, so yes, I mean, antenna, antenna to antenna it is. However, the vocoder, the, the way that this actually works is that the vocoder is providing forward error correction, uh, for, uh, which, can, which can make up for a certain number of, of uh, missed, uh, missed bits or bit errors before, uh, um, before it's, uh, you can't reconstruct the signal. So, so the signal strength, but not intelligibility. I tried to play a video that um, that they've recorded. You can find some of these on the internet. It gives you an idea of what DMR sounds like, and also gives you an idea of DMR comparison to analog in a low in a low. Uh, uh, they did a side by side comparison with a, um, with the same amount of attenuation between the radios, and you can hear the digital voice. You can hear a lot more clearly, uh, even even after. Uh, the signals degraded. So a couple other, uh, because uh, because we're transmitting only in one time slot, this incre in increases the battery life of the radio. And uh, an another star here, because your mileage may vary on that. Um, it, it, you're, you are, remember the vocoder is actually packing your 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 uh, your uh, voice that's continuous into these into these small 30 millisecond segments and transmitting them along with other framing bits and addressing information. And, uh, and sync bits. So the effective uh, the effective throughput is um, is greatly reduced um, from a. Uh, let me rephrase that. The effective uh, the effective um, amount of time it takes to to transmit your signal remains the same, but it's done in a much shorter period of time. So therefore, the radio is only transmitting about 40 46 percent of the time, and and many people find that their radio lasts longer if you're transmitting often. Um, but as I mentioned, it takes power to run the DSP and the vocoder, so that uh, burns a little more energy. Um, DMR supports encryption. Again, this, uh, this technology came out of the commercial world, and uh, encryption or privacy is important to a lot of people. However, we don't do any of that on ham radio, and uh, it's, uh, as it's not allowed by our rules. And so that's just a feature that's not activated. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you can use these radios through repeaters and simplex the same as well as uh, audio packet-based internet connection between repeaters or, or groups of repeaters, um, which forward the digital packets out over the air, as well as off to the internet, where they're shared with many other, uh, many other repeater systems. And that's one of the, one of the um, very popular ways to operate DMR radio. Um, and then there's some other features available we'll talk about a little bit later from a professional radio system. So I wanted to just quickly, briefly mention back to this slide about the, the parts of a digital radio. Um, these are the components of comparing D-Star, DMR, Fusion, and APCO 25. So um, uh, while well, I love to talk to, um, uh, I, we'd love to have more people use the repeater and operate with us. I didn't come to sell you that you have to buy a radio, and, this, and ours is better than others. I just wanted to make sure everybody was uh, was aware of it. And there's and some of the future slides here are going to go into some more details because the programming. Of, DMR radios is quite different, you'll find, than, um, than uh, analog or even D-star radios. Um, any questions so far? I, I'm not, I wasn't going to talk too much today, other than to point out that D-star, DMR Fusion, and P25 all use the same vocoder, except for uh, D-star, which uses the original AMBE vocoder. Uh, so at that, that point, at that point, your audio is uh, no longer available to be spit back out to a D-Star radio, even if you even if you make a cross connects uh, in the digital stream. Um, <coughs> they all they all offer forward error correction. Um, they're all uh, they're all uh, frequency division multiple access, except after APCO P25. I'm talking about phase one. If you're familiar with phase one versus two, P25 now has time slot TDMA mm -hmm. as well. Um, and actually uh, d doubles the throughput in that manner. Um, and, then, and then again, DMR with the time slots offers uh, two data streams in the one, in the one space. So the next thing I wanted to spend a few minutes and talk about is uh, DMR terminology. Um, I mentioned that uh, DMR, uh, DMR equipment, they're all radios. Um, uh, when it comes to antennas and feed lines and and, and path loss and other calculations, it's, it is radio. There are some things that the vocoder does in terms of forward error correction in order to improve that, uh, imp improve the, your experience. But in the end, if your if your coax breaks, you don't have a you don't have a link. Um, so uh, some 
<clears throat> so I'm going to use some terminology and, and do my best to introduce it. If I say something that doesn't make sense, you know, wait, raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll step back and, and make sure I explain it because um, I've been using I've been using and programming DMR for a while, and uh, once you get used to it, it, things make sense. But I remember, like many of you. I sat with the DMR radio on the table for a few week, a few days until I kind of figured it out. And, and, uh, and there's some tools that help you actually. You can log in. I'll show you how you can log into the internet and see if your radio can, your radios are going out to the gateway or not. So, so so a lot of the naming conventions come from historical context in the professional public safety and military radio. Um, some of the terms may not be familiar to amateur radio operators, and that's probably uh, a little bit daunting when you're sitting down to program your radio. Um, it's not as simple as, uh, as typing in a frequency and keying up, because, the, because uh, again, we have to, at the very minimum, decide which talk loop we're going to be transmitting in, or time slot we're going to be transmitting in, of those two. And uh, the radios can't really be easily programmed uh, from a front panel, although some support that. Um, commercial rules historically don't allow the user to make changes to his radio because most of the people using commercial radios are hams and will end up on a different frequency um, or different mode or the wrong place and not be able to talk to the people and then think the radio is broken and send it back to Aurora. Um, so we, we program a radio using a PC, which a lot of, a lot of conventional FM radios and D-Star radios are already doing because there's so many features. Um, spend a little bit of money and get the USB cable or serial connection to have a nice display and type out all your frequencies from maybe a program like Chirp or something like that and plug it into your radio. It helps a lot, a lot easier than rotating the channel and off and selecting uh, names. So the first thing that's important about DMR is every radio has a radio ID and this is something that you have to program into the radio and when you try to access the repeater without a radio ID or using the default radio ID, it's going to reject you. Again, it's IP. It, can, it, it, it's check, it checks your radio identifier against if it's valid or not, and then if it finds that it's not a valid ID, it will reject it, um, which it can do. Um, the, again, the radio ID is set a part of every transmission. And other radios, uh, other radios maintain a, a lookup table of other radio IDs. So, Everybody in the club would perhaps publish, you know, make a, make a list that shares that has your call sign and name and radio ID, and everybody would be responsible for programming everybody else's radio ID and name into their radios. So when, when one person transmits, their, uh, their radio ID comes across and, it's, and, a, and on their screen is displayed the call sign of the person. So it's important to note that you're actually sending an ID number and not your <coughs> call sign text. So you're not technically IDing per FCC rules, or we're only doing a lookup table, which is what the radio offers. Is that like an IP protocol? Is that why that's required? Um, there ha yes, there has to be, you have to have, a, in framing, you have to have a, two, a, two, a destination address and a, and a from address in order for it to be routed correctly. Um, your radio, will, your radio will accept all IDs, and, and you can program your repeater to accept all IDs, um, but, uh, you won't be able to identify the user on the rate on the repeater, and many many radio many of the radio hardware actually will reject a call that comes from the same ID, just the way your computer might reject uh, might reject a packet that says it's coming from the same IP address. It knows better. Um, some radios will accept everybody, including your own ID. Yeah, they're, they're, one of the, the things that I think is useful about understanding DMR is that. The radio to radio connection itself will go through. It's a question of whether your radio on squelches or not, based on the ID itself. So there's two two pieces to a call in DMR. There's a group call and a uh, private call. Private calls you have to be able to, to differentiate the group the uh, individual radio IDs on both ends. Group calls anybody can listen to, and all you have to do is set your radio to on squelch when that particular group ID is brought forward. Furthermore, some radios, especially like the Titeras, have what's called promiscuous mode, where it literally will squelch on anything, uh, no matter what's thrown at it. I'm going to talk about group calls and individual calls in a minute. But first, in order to use DMR, you need a radio ID, which is free and, and pretty easy to get. And I put a link here, and we'll, I think we'll be, sh we'll be sharing the slide presentation. So um, you can access, uh, you can go to the DMR Mark uh, website, which is one of the, one of the ham radio policy 
sort of management uh, organizations that helps uh, helps adapt the technology for ham radio, and they also maintain the master database of all of the uh, of all of the radio IDs in the world. And I've got a slide a little bit later that shows how many there are. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You just fill out you fill out a form, and uh, you can't really see, but these are the five these are the five radio IDs that show up in Vienna. So that was probably the five of you who raised your hands. So you can search online. <laughs> you can search online if you, if you if your radio is only showing an ID. That means you have that person probably got their ID after you last updated your, your radio. And uh, so if you just see a number, you can go look it up online and see who that was by their registration. Um, in ham radio, we use uh, our radio IDs are eight digits. They they plan on that being large enough to include everybody. Um, the first four digits indicate the state or country. Um, in Virginia, ours, ours all start with uh, 3151, and then they ran out of the last four digits. They, uh, so now they also start with 1151, and they are issuing those as well. Four digits. Uh, yeah, so it's an, eight, it's an eight digit ID, and uh, like one here is, uh, I can't read it at all. Four bits or four? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's decimal. 3151250, for example, is Mark, and I'll leave uh, 81 RBA is here uh, in Vienna. But um, you, if you look at the way that the IDs are handed out, if it's a six digit ID, it's a repeater. If it's an eight digit ID, it's a subscriber. That's another, that's another, uh, that's another commercial term. And, and you can, a lot of people think of it like a, hand, like a cell phone handset, a subscriber unit, or mo portable or mobile joins the repeater system. So the next thing to talk about is the talk group. So uh, <clears throat> the talk group can be best, uh, best identified by a, a kind of referred to as a squelch group that allows groups, similar groups, to share a time slot or share a channel without bothering each other. So um, if, anybody, if anybody had worked um, in commercial radio, you may have heard of a community repeater where multiple, uh, multiple organizations share one VHF channel and they use different PL tones in order to CT CSS tones. So it's, it's assuming that there won't, you know, that there will be minimal contention between people needing to use the radio a lot and uh, each group doesn't have to buy their own repeater. So that's how you can think of a, of a squelch group. Um, again, similarly, only one talk group or user, or one talk group can use, a, can use a time slot at the same time. So if I am operating on, the, on one of the talk groups like this one at the bottom that says uh, Virginia uh, statewide, uh, if I'm transmitting on Virginia statewide on one of the time slots, just as any other repeater channel, someone can't step on me. Uh, if they step on my transmission into the repeater, um, you would not be able to make connection with where you're trying to go. Um, it's a little. It makes it. It makes the idea of listen before transmit a little bit different because you need to. You'll need to take a look at your radio and see if it shows a channel indicator, a channel in use, and uh, the radios can actually be programmed to uh, only transmit if um, your particular it, it, if it's not currently in use. So. They actually, some of them offer what sounds like a busy signal you can program. Um, if, I, if someone were transmitting on a radio and I tried to use the same channel, my radio would make a busy signal. Some of them just do a constant tone um, uh, ch uh, access denied alert. So talk groups are kind of similar in some of the other digital modes as well, digital voice modes as well. D-Star calls them reflectors. So uh, it, my repeater could be tied to a wider area reflector and, any, and anything uh, anything that goes into it comes out of the same rate repeater as well as all of the other repeaters that are listening to that reflector. And uh, Yesu Fusion calls them rooms, uh, similar concept. Um, these allow the users on the channel to be separated perhaps by, by job, location, language, etc. Um, and uh, your, the talk group you're using propagates the radio signal along, propagates the network along with your, uh, your transmission and your audio. So where it, when it comes out on the other side, on a time slot, the, that particular user will also know what talk group, which talk group you're using. So if I were to transmit into, into the repeater here locally on the Virginia statewide group, and my, uh, my transmission went into the repeater, it came out on a Virginia statewide group, just like a normal repeater to the user. It also goes on to, it also goes on to the internet, and other repeaters who are subscribed to, um, 
the Virginia statewide group would also turn on their transmitters and my audio would come out to those users as well. And then the users would have to have the radio tuned, turned to, to unsquelch on statewide in order to hear me. Um, and uh, <coughs> the talk groups have their, uh, have their own different looking radio IDs. For, um, uh, for example, um, as I mentioned, uh, 3151 is a group I would transmit to for a, any, for a Virginia statewide group. CAC, CAC 312 is talk around channel 312 is a nation, actually an international group that if uh, I were to transmit into the TAC 312 group, um, anybody who's on a repeater anywhere in the world and their repeater supported TAC 312 and they had their radio turned to TAC 312, they'd be able to hear my audio. So it's very common to be listening to one of these TAC channels which are designed to be, uh, to be talk channels, not you, um, you could think of it um, as uh, similar to calling on 5-2, you might make a call on the worldwide English channel, and anybody tuned to that would hear your call, but you can imagine how quickly that would get pretty busy with everybody carrying on QSOs, you can only have one at a time on that channel, so you might quickly say, let's go over to TAC 312 and talk to each other. And so I've, you know, I've brought, turned, my, turned my radio to TAC 312 sitting in the armchair and listening to a guy in Iowa and one in Arizona talking to each other, and it's coming out of our local repeater and I get to hear it and um, maybe chime in if I want to. Some nets operate on these TAC channels as well. And uh, as I mentioned, there's like a, there's a worldwide English uh, channel. So this can be thought of as a subdomain? Uh, they're, yeah, they're more or less uh, a way to shift talk into areas that don't tie up a single shared resource. So for example, the, the single meeting place, if you think about it working in HF, you may call on a common calling channel and shift your, your QSO somewhere else. The same thing. If you make a call on Virginia statewide, you don't want to talk to your buddy in Blacksburg tying up every repeater in the state all at the same time. You want to switch to attack channel so only your two repeaters are talking to each other. Make sense? I want to start with thinking about simplex. I could have, I could have, at the simplex level, I could have five groups in the same room. Maybe at, maybe at Winterfest, you have the, the, the gate, the ticket takers, and you have the snack uh, sale people, and you have the, uh, the parkers out in the parking lot, and then you have the people making sure that connectivity and power is available to all the users. But you only have one repeater to use that Brendan set up for you. And uh, you, can have, you can have multiple groups all use their own talk group on the same frequency, and the, the likelihood of the ticket taker needing to say something at the exact same time as the, uh, as the uh, uh, AC power delivery hookup people um, is, is theoretically low. Um, it is ham radio. So there are uh, lots of um, there are lots of talk groups you can uh, on Simplex you could make up any talk group you wanted to use by number and uh, identify to each other uh, or, and, and communicate with each other on Simplex. And then going one step above that through a local repeater is if you stood up just a very basic local repeater, um, you would have the two, two time slots to yourself, on, and each one could carry as many talk groups as you wanted to. So the nice thing about that is, you know, one repeater, um, you have two groups of people. Uh, now, you, now you have uh, the people who are doing uh, another activity, uh, setting up for another emergency service event, bike races the same morning. They seem to always schedule the same things on the same days. So the bike race people are using time slot one, and the Winterfest people are using time slot two, and they each have their own groups of talk groups to talk to each other, and they don't bother each other on each other's time slot, and they don't cross time slots. Does that depend on non-maximal use or anything like that? It does. Uh, obviously, uh, just as when, an F, when the FM repeater's in use, nobody can jump in and, and step on, on each other, and uh, there are there would be, you know. So you get some sense of whether or not you're getting close to channel saturation? We're not there yet. Um, but yes, uh, but yes, there, there are some tools on the repeater management side of things um, that Steve can look at if we're starting to find ourselves on the rush hour getting busy with more than one talk group operating, uh, trying to operate in the same time slot, then it's time to consider adding another repeater to the area or... Um, no, uh, I meant the, you know. the actual user, is there any indication from the radio, that, you know, like a busy signal? Yeah. Sure, like you get a busy I mean, signal. Busy signal. Yeah, the nice thing is instead of instead of uh, forgetting your volumes down and keying up over someone and getting the double sound you get on a, on, on FM, uh, your radio will can be programmed. You can you can program your radio in, in many ways. Everybody programs their own radio. 
um, you can set it up in polite mode or, uh, ch uh, or uh, channel clear mode, and your radio won't even allow you to send RF out if, if there's signal coming down in your time slot. Sorry. Just, uh, you mentioned simplex a couple of times. Is that a true simplex between two radios, or do you need some sort of infrastructure to drive No, uh, two radios can operate to talk to each other on simplex, and I have these programs. So when I transmit, um, I borrowed this from my friend Mark, and it shows this radio is from Mark, and it shows Mark's call sign on the screen. And I'm on Simplex right now, 441.0. And then he doesn't have my radio ID on his radio, so mine just shows the radio ID because the lookup table isn't present. And the latency is the processing, or is that? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the vocoder and DSP. Does the standard allow for dynamic allocation of the time slots? It, tier three does. Uh, so tier three does. Tier two, you can do dynamic allocation of time slots, and Motorola does. Uh, there's a Motorola proprietary version uh, called Connect Plus uh, or Link uh, Connect Plus, which does do dynamic allocation of time slots. But it's not in the standard. It's not a Etsy standard version, right? So you have to go all the way to tier three, which is a more expensive implementation in terms of processor power in the radios, but more importantly in the control software that's required to run the repeaters themselves. So the interesting comparison to the cellular telephone network is if you look at the expense required to operate the MSC, the mobile switching center, for a cell phone network compared to the base equipment that's required for a DMR network, it's orders of magnitude cheaper to run DMR. A DMR, a Motorola DMR repeater is about $3,000 uh, retail price, where a mobile switching center is in, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 at least. Exactly. Don't be scared about the price yet. We're going to start too big anyway. Everybody here, look under your chairs. Um, so uh, the next thing, that, the next configuration item is called the ch is called a channel, and uh, and not and here I'm not talking about necessarily a talk path or even an RF uh, RF occupied bandwidth channel. Um, this is how your radio will be configured. You're going to pull a lot of your, pull this information together. You're going to pull your radio ID. You're going to pull the radio ID of the talk group you want to talk to, or perhaps your buddy's radio ID. And you're going to make a channel. Uh, when you configure it, you need here we here we get, finally get to radio. You need your RF transmit and receive frequency. Then you need to define a color code. And there's 16 color codes available. And since they're called color codes, they use numbers to identify them, and they never made colors for it. Um, that's just like a PL tone. Now, how your local repeater, there may be a repeater, I'm not sure where your nearest co-channel um, VHF or UHF uh, repeater operates, but you likely have a PL tone so that on uh, when you have um, ducting in the morning in the summertime, you don't hear uh, their transmissions don't key up your repeater. They don't have the PL access set correct set to access your repeater. That's the exact same way that color code works. And the nice thing is, is DMR is not saturated enough in, in the ham radio bands, and most DMR operates on color code one, although I'll show you a little bit later how you can check which color code to set, and it's set at the repeater level, not, at, uh, not by talk group. So after you've defined the frequency and the color code, uh, you need to select which time slot you're gonna be using. So when I transmit, um, I want to make sure I'm going to transmit in the correct time slot, so when the repeater receives my signal, um, it routes it where it's supposed to go. Um, I then, now I have a time slot and now I have a talk group number. And we talked about uh, talk groups. I need to select which ones I want to, which one I'm going to transmit to when I push the PTT button. And it, and it offers the ability to select which ones you want to receive from as well. And Steve mentioned uh, promiscuous mode, which is, which is um, I, I believe that Skyterra only offers that, um, where you could basically receive all call and any any transmission that goes out, your radio would unsquelch for. The downside to that, without setting it up properly, is that you may receive a call, uh, you might hear a, hear a voice come out of the speaker, and your radio is set to transmit on a different channel than he was talking on. Um, so it's generally a good practice to um, either create a list with the same radio ID in it, or same group call in it, um, or I don't have a specific one on group call and private call. I have that in the programming section a little bit later. Um, you, have a, you have a large list, and in the list, you'll have uh, the talk groups that you want to identify, and you're going to basically have a lookup table, which includes 3151, and you call it Virginia Statewide, 312, CAC 312, and then you'll have uh, 3151, 469, and Ben and 4CD in there, 
Um, and so <clears throat> from that same list is where you'll select uh, where you select which talk group you want to transmit out to. There's the ham-produced DMR radios offer promiscuous mode out of the box, is the question. Um, the Titeras, you can argue, are aimed at the ham market as much as they are at the commercial market. They were initially a commercial radio, though hams seem to be the biggest buyers of them right now. Um, one thing that, that I would suggest is if you're buying a DMR radio for the first time, don't buy a valve phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Um, they are really, really impolite when it comes to spectral quality, and uh, they are not implementing the DMR standard properly, so you will end up causing all sorts of mayhem, and you'll be very sad because you won't be able to hear anybody. Um, so don't waste your money. Uh, as a, a cheapy FM handheld, they're awesome little radios, but don't use them for DMR. What about Titeras? The Titeras are quality radios. Uh, they're they're well made. Uh, they have a lot of features. Um, they're relatively idiot proof in terms of operation. Once you get the program, they are a royal pain in the neck to get programmed the first time. Um, the software was clearly not written in English, and it was been translated. So occasionally you get error screens that are in Chinese, which is kind of fun to deal with. Uh, but once you get them functional, they're relatively inexpensive. They're very durable. They have good audio quality. Um, Plenty of speaker volume, uh, reasonable microphone selectivity, and uh, they work. Um, I happen to be a Motorola freak, but that's just my history working with this stuff. Um, I would say these are probably a good starting point for most people. Is that the TYT? Yes. yes. Okay. MD380 is um, very popular. I had to look through and find a contact list to share, and um, this, well, of course, the screen resolution isn't quite great enough, but. You'll be able to see here that um, this is this, these are shots of the same list. The top of my list, I have what are called group calls, which are my repeater, which are my talk groups that I want to, want to reach to. And here, we see that in North America, we see the TAC 312, um, you know, Canada, UK, there's a simplex group that I'm going to specifically be using. And then farther down the list is where I have the people I know. Um, so uh, you'll see, you know, you'll see call signs and, uh, and, and radio IDs that people have registered for. And I've stored in my radio. Um, so when I go to program my radio, when I go to program my radio by channel, which I'm talking about channel, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just use this screen to do it. Um, this is where I'm going to drop down and select which talk, which talk group I want to transmit out to. So my TX contact is, is um, going to be the local talk group, um, whereas my, uh, um, my receive group list, if I leave it blank, my radio is going to default to receiving from that local talk group. Um, I could also create group lists of groups if I wanted to m monitor multiple talk groups at the same time. Is that called scan? Or what? Um, that's a little bit different than scan. Uh, that's just called a receive group list. And uh, <clears throat> you can, um, let's see, an example of that might be where you have, maybe you have a large bike race and you have the group that's north of 66 and the group is south of 66 operating. And they, they're busy enough that they each have their own talk group going on they might, um, on the same time slot. But in order to say, you know, in order to make announcements, the first biker started out, you don't want to confuse the people on the other side of the area that their group hasn't started yet. You may be using two talk groups on the same time slot. And one of your, um, one of your net controllers, or you may have some radios that you programmed that you want to listen to both time talk groups, but only transmit on one of them or the other. So I could program my radio so position one listens to both and transmits to the north side group, and when I change it, it still listens to both, but it transmits out to the south side group. So you can create a group list made up of, of group calls, receive group list made up of transmit group calls, and they can be picked, and they can be configured that way. Yes. So in that situation, would you hear both audios, or would one audio block the other? You would hear both equally, no priority. I had these um, I had these slides down here farther for uh, backup slides, but uh, <clears throat> we got to them we got to them pretty quickly. So uh, I'll go back and continue. Just a couple other comments about the. Uh, couple other comments about the channel. Um, this defines the RF transmit and receive frequencies, as I mentioned. We're down to setting the talk group. Admit criteria is what I mentioned before, when your radio is, gonna, is going to be allowed to transmit. So this is where you'll want to configure your radio for color code free, which means that 
Um, the PL route is available. You don't care if the group in uh, uh, Richmond is operating on the same frequency as you, um, and you hear them slightly above your noise floor. You don't want that to cause your radio to give you a talk deny uh, beep. And then um, other channels. So, so, yeah. so to do that, you go to a different color code, or what do you do? If you're on the same frequency, we, we only have four megahertz and less, fewer than that in VHF, for example, in, in two meters. Um, you you oftentimes will have two repeaters operating on the same frequency. And in FM mode, you would use uh, PL tones to designate which repeater you're trying to access. And in DMR, you're using a, what's called a color code, 1 through 16 for that. And there's not enough DMR repeaters out there yet in the area, in the nearby areas, to need different uh, color codes for different, uh, to separate repeater systems. They do it in the HF more. Already. Yeah, I have a different color code than KA3LAO when we're both on 145, 170. Okay. We can hear each other. UHF has a lot, a lot more bandwidth to work with. And, uh... So then the last thing you need to do when you configure your radio is you need to get your groups of channels you want and you need to assign them to, your ra to, to a zone. And a zone is a group of channels on the radio that's programmed into, into the list and allows the radio uh, it, it basically, in order to be able to see the radio on the screen and have it selectable, you need to assign it to a zone. Um, you could think of these, some people, like I program my VHF uh, uh, FM mobile radio to like um, groups 1 through 20 are Virginia repeaters, uh, channel spot number 20 through 25, or 20 through 30 are Maryland, and you know, might have some Pennsylvania ones, repeaters all. Um, even if I haven't used all 20 of the, in Virginia, I leave space because there will always there'll be new repeaters coming on the air. Um, so I will, uh, so in the same manner, I basically divided my radio up into zones, and so I know if I quickly tune up to number 20, I'm now in Maryland. Um, on the radio, uh, on the DMR radio, it's, uh, you would do that by changing zone, and typically zones, some radios hold an infinite number of many, many channels per zone, and you just continually rotate the channel selector knob until you get there, kind of like my Yesu works. Um, and my, uh, um, and the other, and, and many, radios are limited to 16 channels in the zone. So I need to pick my 16 favorite channels or whatever I choose to do, um, however I choose to divide them up. So a uh, very common way to do this, if you're thinking about the way, and it help, it'll help you keep track of the way the radio is programmed and the way the uh, repeater talk groups are assigned, is have a zone for each time slot. So I might, uh, the, uh, the repeater we'll talk about in a couple of minutes is Herndon, and I might have a Herndon time slot one zone and a Herndon time slot two zone, and then there's 10 or 12 different talk groups within that zone that are, that, are, um, that are available in each of those zones. And so I know if I want to move to a different talk group on Herndon, I may have to change zones. And just like some more, some of the higher end radios now, you can select buttons and things like that, and you can set it so pressing, holding the up button changes zones up one and down one. So you don't have to be driving and fiddling in a menu structure. It, it's in order to see, once you program a radio, a, a channel, and you've configured it in CPS, in your, in your computer programming software, um, you need to assign it to a zone in order to be able to find it in the radio. Otherwise, it'll be stored there, but it won't, have, it won't be mapped to a position on your channel knob at all. Um, so that's a trick that, um, that many people get hung up on is you've made a channel, you've configured these nice channels, but they're not in zones, so you can't find them on the radio. So it's the up-down up button. Um, it depends, again, that's kind of one of, the, one of the cool things is you can program your radio to be different. And when I pick up Mark's radio, which looks exactly the same from the outside, he may have configured his, his side buttons to do different things or channel up and down or press and hold two to jump to, you know, Puerto Rico for when he travels there, who knows. Um, you can set your zones, you can have, you can, most radios can hold a few thousand channels and you can set up a few dozen, dozen or maybe probably even hundred zones and then um, you may, you know, you can select them. It's a lot of programming work to make that many channels though. When you so, press the up and down button, uh, what should be the different display? By default, usually like on a mobile radio, up and down would select the channel. So what, I'm in, uh, uh, what would it say or display? Um, that whatever you, whatever you tell it to in the, in the programming, you have the opportunity. Just like when I program an FM, if I, if I program in your repeater frequency, I'm probably not gonna remember it anymore after I type it in. Um, in VHF, you do a little thing on the ASU, and you rotate, push, and rotate, and push, and rotate, and make, a, make an alpha character display. You do that in 
Got a keyboard though for DMR. You assign a table name or anything. Yes. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, so, so if I'm on a particular mission, I might uh, want to uh, dezone <coughs> a bunch of uh, channels uh, so that I'm not distracted by them uh, as far as tuning and mm -hmm. planning for that mission. You may want you, you may want to in the computer though, but if you're doing that, you may just want to save that file, back it up, make a new file, and spit it in the radio. So if you travel a lot and you go back and forth between the west, you know, San Francisco and here, well, a lot's not a good idea because you probably would be reconfiguring your radio every week. But if you, you know, if you if you're getting ready to go on a trip to somewhere, you may want to sit down with your radio and and retrieve the code plug out of your USB yeah. connector, save it as a file and then edit and say that as a different file and put that in your radio. But yes, you can de de assign them. And some radios, which I, I didn't, I'm not gonna talk a lot about tonight, some of the more advanced features, but some of them do allow you to configure that on the fly with the front panel under settings and menus. But every single one of these manufacturers does things a little bit differently. And yeah. Excuse me. Yes. Can we hold questions till the end because we have to finish the presentation and we have to clear out at okay. a certain time, okay. please. Thank How you. How much longer do we have? It's, it's about four minutes to nine. Uh, if everybody holds their questions, you'll get through because okay. I think we have to be out here by clean up by 9:20 and out by 9:30. Okay, we'll get we'll, we'll get on a move then. Um, and I'm available. My email address is on the is on the last slide. If you have questions, or we can meet in the hallway out afterwards. Um, so repeaters are configured to uh, again provide the two time slots. Um, they receive on both time slots independently. And they transmit full duty cycle on both. Um, the repeater is what uh, on a repeater system. This is what this is where the time reference comes from. So your radio knows which time slot of 30 milliseconds to transmit in. Um, they don't require internet, internet access. A DMR repeater that looks like that can sit uh, can sit on a shelf with a duplex or an antenna, or even replace the one you have now and uh, offer you offer both uh, two time slots, and you can double your capacity at that time. You know, with the change of hardware. Um, most 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 uh, DMR repeaters and ham radio are on 70 centimeters now. Um, two meters is growing, and uh, Steve has two repeaters on 900 megahertz as well. Um, and the two most common, I've never heard of any other repeaters being uh, Motorola and Hytera. Um, <clears throat> so the next thing that happens is uh, you're, you'll have the best user experience when you connect your repeater to the internet. And uh, in order to do that, uh, you have, there's two methods to do it. The re repeater itself can just can be plugged in and configured to um, call to a static IP address where a server sits and uh, and all of the connections are take place for you. That, that system is called Brandmeister. And then IP Site Connect uh, is a Motorola protocol. So Motorola repeaters and actually um, Brandmeister repeaters do it in a, or excuse me, Hytera repeaters do it in a slightly different manner. Um, operate with what's called a C bridge and that allows the, the, the repeater owner to make and break connections with other C bridges or networks. Um, and that's how you can allow certain talk groups to, to be available to the users. Um, very quickly on Brandmeister, we don't have any Brandmeister repeaters in this immediate area. The closest one I know of in Virginia, they just put one up in near Lynchburg. And uh, if you use DMR, you'll probably hear a lot of people from Lynchburg using using it. Um, they uh, what that does is time slot two is always for local and local only. It, it goes there, it goes through the repeater and out, and doesn't go anywhere over the internet. Time slot one offers what they call Brandmeister available talk groups, and there's over 500 different talk groups. So when I configure my radio, and I want, if I'm sitting on my, you know, on my couch at home in Vienna, and I want to listen to what's happening on the Arizona uh, statewide channel, because I have some friends there, or I might want to call, or I might just want to listen in, um, I can activate that channel. In order to do that, I would just select it that I've programmed into my radio, and one tra uh, one per chunk basically notifies the repeater that there's a user trying to operate on that. Uh, talk group and if the repeater is available, it will it'll allocate that talk group to be available on time slot one for in a period of time which is usually five or fifteen minutes. Um, again it's up to the repeater owner. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip the links because you can explore some of these things on your own. But because uh, the because your audio is being routed to the internet and available to other repeaters, um, you can uh, you can also access it online. Brainmeister has kind of a cool interface where you can go and actually listen to your signal and look at your signal strength uh, uh, as it, when it hits the internet. <coughs> some other the other some other networks that are available um, groups of repeater use the IP site connect protocol as I mentioned. Um, a group of peer repeaters uh, will have one master repeater that they connect to. So only one of your repeaters in the group needs to have a static IP address. The rest could be on a cell network or or otherwise. One peer 
can be a C bridge, which is a piece of hardware. Uh, it's a server that that makes the cross connects to other uh, to other networks. So this is kind of higher level if you are looking at putting together a repeater system. Um, and there's some and there's some common networks, and they each offer their own groups of uh, talk group, uh, groups. There's a lot to there's a lot to read and learn about DMR. Um, so I wanted to focus this meeting on um, on how to get on the air. Um, but you you probably will start to hear some of these terminologies like DMR Mark K4 USD PRN is the North Carolina group DMR Virginia is the uh, there's a Virginia statewide group uh, group of people around the state who have network repeaters and uh, Nova DMR is Steve system which is in our local area. <clears throat> Another way to get on the air is with a hotspot. Um, these are these are small. Uh, Brendan has a hotspot running on his computer, and I think he's going to offer a hands-on session at one of the f in, in the near future in, in the place of the CW night. And that's um, those are pretty cool because they allow you, if you're out of the area of a repeater, to get uh, to get on uh, to access the Brandmeister network. And they're in a, and they're relatively inexpensive. They're usually only a few hundred, ten or hundred milliwatts, and uh, they'll cover your house. So it offers you. Um, all of the Brandmeister available 500 plus talk rooms at your house without any contention because you're the only one using it. Um, and then there's a couple of common hardware. Um, okay, so some other features of a digital DMR radio system. Uh, because it supports data, you have a text message interface with your keys and you can send private text messages to other, uh, to other users on Simplex and over the repeater. Yeah, okay. Um, you can do private calls, which may or may not be allowed over a repeater. Again, it all depends on the repeater operator. That would allow you to, instead of choosing a talk group like 3151 Virginia, I might put Brendan's ID in, and then he and I are talking to each other, and no one else on squelches. So we could be tying up. It, it might, it's generally frowned upon because it would be tying up the repeater to anybody else. It's, it's not encrypted. It's going over the, over the DMR standard, but we could have a quick private conversation, and, and no one else's radios would unsquelch for it. Um, it's, it's not private because a scanner or someone in promiscuous mode can still listen in. Um, scanning, uh, Bill asked about scanning, and uh, um, very similarly to your to your VHF radio, you, we can uh, we can scan. <clears throat> scanning might not actually be changing frequencies; it may be just scanning everything on a particular time slot. So I may be just listening out for uh, um, a, a, a list of uh, cycling through a list. Scan is looking at time slot one and two and at the same two. time. Sure. Group receive list is only one time slot. That's a good differentiator. So group receive list lets you does allow your radio to listen to anything on that one time slot at the same time, all up to everything that happens on that time slot. Whereas scan, you can scan through um, other frequencies as well, um, different repeaters as well. Um, roaming is uh, is something that's a little bit more advanced. Um, a lot of the repeaters, especially the ones in this area, offer um, the same talk group, same talk groups available in the same time slot positions. So you can actually set your radio up to roam, and that means uh, the, uh, when you want to access that TAC three one two channel, you would be you might uh, you might be driving around between different uh, radio uh, different in the range of different repeaters, and your radio will automatically jump when you go to transmit. It'll jump over to the nearest repeater that has the strongest receive signal strength. I mentioned talk around mode and simplex, which I will differentiate. Um, some quick facts, which are kind of interesting. Um, there are 85,000 DMR IDs out there. Remember, I mentioned radios often don't de won't unsquelch if they have the same ID in it. So people who have three or four radios might have more than one ID. Um, 38,000 in the U.S. And, uh, and and we have over 1,100 in Virginia, which is pretty cool. Um, and then uh, repeaters, there's a lot of repeaters around, and we have 47 uh, registered in Virginia. Okay, so Steve did a quick, uh, a quick uh, section on, on radios themselves. So the manufacturers, again, are members of that DMR association. Um, they're not really available yet from, the, uh, from what we think of as amateur radio vendors, except Kenwood does have uh, DMR-capable radios. Uh, they're available from many sources. I think Ham Radio Outlet is starting to carry some of these radios. Uh, um, there's other vendors who are selling specifically uh, uh, to Ham uh, DMR users. Um, and the neat thing about them is they're they're actually relatively inexpensive, uh, and they, they vary from inexpensive to very expensive. But um, uh, this radio, which is the Titera uh, radio, is um, is only is only about hundred dollars, and you can get it on Amazon the same day. So. You can get on the air tomorrow. Um, 
So some important considerations to think about if you want a mobile or portable, same thing like radio, if you need a little bit more power or you want more <coughs> fixed installation, a mobile might be a good option. Um, uh, operating band, most of the repeater activity is on UHF, although in some areas VHF is more prevalent. Um, uh, a lot of the radios are analog capable, so I can program an analog talk, uh, talk group or channel into my radio, and I could operate, I could carry one radio around and talk on my same uh, repeater that I'm used to talking on FM, and I think, uh, I think this one and some others are dual band. No, that's not dual band. Okay, it's, it's some, radios are, some radios are dual band, and um, those radios you can operate, yeah, this is the Pecara version. This one's 150, and it does VHF and 150 dollars, and it does VHF and UHF as well. So this kind, if you, if you're comfortable with your, with the group of channels in your radio, and you don't need to be changing it on the fly quite as easily, although you can still do it, um, you could you could replace your your everyday uh, handheld with a DMR radio and be able to talk on analog and digital channels uh, uh, as you choose. Okay, and then different. Uh, the other, and the other thing I, I'm listed on here is DMR compatibility, and as Steve mentioned, the Bowphone radios don't are, are not DMR standard compatible. You didn't I didn't show you the list, but they're not on the list of uh, DMR <laughs> Association members. Their radios are cheap, and they transmit full all of the time. So I showed you in time we need to be transmitting within our 30 milliseconds, and not during the next guy's 30 milliseconds. Their radios work by keying up and only broad only passing traffic during 30 milliseconds but jamming, this, jamming the other time slot all the time. So they only modulate the proper... Right, but they keep the PA biased the whole time. Um, so here's a couple of radio, uh, a couple of radio options. Um, the type, and I put some prices on here, I just kind of Googled around a little bit. Uh, the Titera radio, the MD380 is, is very popular. The UHF version will get you on the air here in Northern Virginia. The, 20, the MD2017, I didn't see how many I actually have here. This one is... Um, uh, VHF and UHF, and uh, <clears throat> and then um, they have a mobile version as well. It's also dual band. Um, Connect Systems offers some radios. Um, they offer uh, some commercial versions of these radios too. But I have their uh, I brought their their mobile to show, which is their CS800, and this one has the removable head and, and all the, a lot of the other features um, that uh, that some of our ham radios do. Um, and then they have a portable version as well. Uh, Hytera, um, you saw I mentioned Hytera makes repeaters, and they're probably the second in the world, uh, I'd pro probably say the second in the world in um, commercial radio DMR. Um, they, have, uh, they, have, uh, they have a radio very similar to this one, um, and uh, all the way up to the $1,000 uh, version, and um, their mobile radios are a little bit more higher. Hey Ben, can I just on. share something real quick? You didn't spend that much on it. That radio you can buy from Gigaparts, and when you, it's a commercial radio, it is there, the PD series. And Gigaparts is the only retailer in the U.S. selling the AR series, which is yet to be released. Um, so they, when I bought that, I register the serial number with Gigaparts. They send me a programming software and firmware that changes that to wideband and front panel pro programmable, oh, cool. and it was $280 as opposed to $795. Ooh. Same exact radio, but you know, oh, software and, mm -hmm. and and yeah. So I bought it because it was you know less than half price. Mm -hmm. And it's also, if you need it for a weapon, it'll crack your skull. It's a, it's a threat. <laughs> Anytone is another radio that's on the market now, and um, this one's actually pretty popular. It's a dual band, and um, I think some of the early firmware versions had a few issues. That's one of the cool things about the experimenting in this world. Hytera uh, and probably maybe Titera are the two that so far that, uh, that commercial users use. There, a lot of these other ones have been developed to the standard and are members of the association, but they're not very popular in the U.S. and they're not bought very often by commercial users. So the prices are lower and they've, they've built them, you know, the chassis of this MD380 because it costs only $100. I don't think it's you know, plastic. And, um, but as Steve mentioned, it works really well and the battery lasts. I used to use this driving around all of the time um, and, uh, you know, from in the vehicle. And uh, the battery, I didn't only have to charge it every two weeks or so. Um, and then uh, Motorola Solutions, uh, their product line is called Moto Turbo. And uh, we've got a kind of a range, uh, I've got, uh, Steve brought a couple of their radios. This, um, this one is similar to the XPR 7550. Notice the price is on here. Um, if you want it, you don't have to ask. Um, this, is, uh, this is their XPR 40, uh, 4500 mobile radio. Um, and then they have the 5550, which is a color screen version. They have some kind of cool, uh, kind of cool ones. Not that the others don't. They have one that's this small two-watt radio that um, looks like a cell phone. It has a little belt, look like a cell phone. 
And then this one, you can't really see in the picture, but they actually have invented a screen that sits behind the part of the chassis, the case. So you, the screen name actually shows up, and your radio ID shows up through this, through the case, which is kind of cool. Anyway. Hmm? Um, new, uh, new eight. Eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars for a portable, and around a thousand for mobile. And on the used market, You're about three hundred fifty, four hundred bucks. Yeah, from reputable retailers. But then Motorola is the only one I know of that also has a closed CPS programming <coughs> tool. So you'll spend another three hundred dollars to be to get the software and eighty dollars to get the cable to program your radio. But the radio, the cables, basically need one for a mobile and one for a portable. Save <laughs> eighty bucks. <laughs> And then there's some other interesting uh, other brands out there. Uh, a friend of mine has a Terra radio, which is a waterproof version. It looks very similar to the Thai Terra. Um, this RF Finder uh, Android radio is pretty interesting. It's actually integrated a phone with a four watt UHF radio, and um, you can they'll, <laughs> you can just click on who you want to on the on the talk group you want to talk to, and uh, it'll configure the radio internally, and then you've got a four watt transmitter, and it's an Android phone. Um, okay, so then I wanted to go through the local repeater systems. Uh, as you can see, this is kind of a map of our of our region, and each of the red dots is is a, is a standalone repeater um, that's that's networked in. Um, we have K4USD, DMR Mark, and Brandmeister nationwide repeaters, um, as well as in this immediate area. And these repeaters are interconnected between their group uh, C bridges with other networks. So uh, DMR Virginia is a group um, of guys out of uh, Richmond who. Um, have, uh, who have you know reached out and they've built a DMR system. They've reached out to local uh, mountaintop sites and high buildings in Richmond and other places, and they've built um, a, a pretty a pretty robust uh, DMR system throughout the state. Which uh, green is um, green is generally portable coverage, and yellow is going to be generally mobile coverage. And um, <clears throat> you can see that they have most of the most of the uh, Piedmont region covered. Um, that's one repeater on the eastern shore. It's very flat there. Um, and uh, around the DC area, they have uh, some repeaters, which I'll quickly go through. Um, I will mention that um, it's worth it's worth visiting um, the uh, the DMR Virginia minimal net watch. What that is, each C bridge has a place you can go on the public internet and look at a listing of transmissions that are being made. Um, so I can uh, so I can bring up this uh, this um, this listing. And when I transmit, when I transmit here, N4CV via KM4HRR, I'm using Brendan's radio, and you'll see um, this uh, my call sign show up in the uh, in the list. So it also shows your receive signal strength and bit error rate. N4CV clear, 3151. Okay. And the links are in here, and you can also, when you go to the the, the organization's website, you'll be you can. When you go to the organization's website, you'll be able to visit their uh, their, their NetWatch link. Um, so just some quick uh, quickly, they have a repeater in, in Washington D.C. that covers uh, very close in out to Tyson's area. They have a great repeater out in um, in Linden, and uh, even though it's out near where 17 and 66 split out near uh, near Front Royal, um, it covers very well into this area. I mean, I can hit it from my house in Sterling, and I think you said you can reach it from Vienna and a lot of places down along 66. You can see it. Just has great coverage. It's at a very high site on a TV transmitter tower. Um, and ARIT Rod also put up a repeater in Fredericksburg, which has coverage a little bit to our south. So if you're heading down 95 from the main map between <coughs> DC, Fredericksburg, and into Richmond, all along 95, you would have DMR coverage. Um, and they've, uh, the Alexandria Radio Club recently put up a uh, repeater also to fill in that um, that, <coughs> that low area as you go down toward uh, toward DC inside the Beltway. Um, and then I have a little bit of information on um, the Nova DMR system, which uh, which Steve has put together. Um, this is a local network with um, a, around five repeaters overall right now. Um, common talk groups with the DMR VA system, um, and it off also offers in Maryland, Pennsylvania. Um, there's a Washington, Baltimore local talk group. Uh, guys that get on there around Baltimore and York, Pennsylvania. You can tune your radio to that and get on and chat with somebody on the drive time. Um, I like to, uh, and, and since it carries a lot of the same top groups, or all of the same top groups in the same time slot configurations as the, the as the uh, DMR Virginia group, um, this morning on my way to work, I talked to one of my good old ham friends, good old friends in uh, Wallops Island uh, on the Eastern Shore, 
uh, and a friend of mine in Charlottesville, and the three of us were just going around on our way to our respective offices, and then we all happened to get there around the same time, so it's at 7.30 and turn the radios off. But um, it's, uh, the Herndon Repeater has, uh, has very good coverage. It's in the World Gate area of, um, along the Dulles Toll Road, um, and it's, so it's a really high, relatively high location and has a, um, and has a pretty high gain antenna. Um, see, it has a 100 watt uh, amplifier on it and a uh, receive preamp available as well which is on. <clears throat> this is probably the repeater you'll use, I use the most, and you'll find uh, it has the best coverage around this uh, Potomac River down to uh, 66. Wow, the colors are really different up there than they are here. <laughs> um, there's a 900 megahertz repeater, and if you have, um, if you have 900 megahertz uh, radios, which uh, may be, may in some cases, 900 Motorola radios are cheaper than UHF, because there's not a lot of reuse for them. Um, I bought five 900 megahertz Motorola radios for 125 bucks. Wow. And if you look total, 25 bucks a radio. <laughs> okay. Um, the newest re newest repeater is online in Arlington now, and this is in the Boston neighborhood of Arlington, and um, this will have this one has great coverage uh, across uh, around the Beltway into DC, um, over into Maryland. We haven't done a lot of coverage testing, so if you, as you um, as you do coverage testing, you find obvious holes that you don't think should be there. Um, as you're close in, send me an email, or and I'll get it over to Steve, and we can uh, um, we can look at ways to possibly improve coverage in some areas because this is this is all prediction, and it hasn't been tested that thoroughly. Subway. Hmm. Subway tested. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to make any promises for that. <laughs> um. Okay. And Arlington. Uh, yeah, that was the Arlington UHF uh, Vienna. Um, in the uh, northern, northern part of Vienna, near the Dulles Toll Road, um, Steve has a repeater site where he has a, another, uh, another uh, UHF repeater, which we can access from outside the building, but not inside this building. Is that um, one on a different color code? Hmm? That it's a different on? frequency. Yeah. Um, I, I want to make sure I get to the point where I show you where to find frequencies and color codes and things, so I'm going to keep, keep clicking through. Um, uh, there's, there's a VHF repeater in Vienna, and there's one going up in... Uh, heard in as well, and then another 900 there. So he here's how you can find other other repeaters. Um, this is repeaterbook.com, which um, is very very popular um, way to get your repeaters now. Um, you can look up by area, click on special type. I think uh, you can sort by type of radio, and you can repeater, and you can go to DMR, and then this is where you'll find the top group list. And here I'm just going to tell you this is TAC 310, top group or uh, time slot one, top group. 310 number and PTT access and it shows color code one for this repeater. So everything I told you you need is, is published there. And then um, on the DMR Mark website they have a nice map interface and uh, their repeaters are listed here um, again and it shows uh, time slot, group call number, color code one, frequency and offset. <clears throat> You can use Simplex, and that's really popular, uh, like at a ham fest or things like that. When you're trying to, t when you want to talk to individuals at a ham fest, um, uh, and you might not be in range of a repeater, you can actually go radio to radio. Um, these are the common calling channels for DMR. Um, you can pick, you can operate DMR wherever you want to in the ham band. So you may want to. I would not suggest doing 14652, but you could use a UHF channel of your choice um, for uh, you and your group, just like you might on FM. <coughs> And then uh, configure the channel for uh, talk group. Uh, these are the common talk groups, uh, common configurations. If you're going to be using that calling channel, um, you're going to want to set your radio for talk group 99, color code 1, time slot 1. Um, always transmit, otherwise your radio is going to go out and try to find a repeater that's not going to respond, and it'll, you'll get a busy signal, an unavailable signal. So to get on the air, get your radio ID, find the repeaters in your area. They're listed in the ARL repeater book, I think, starting this year also. Um, make sure you set your radio ID in your radio. Turn off the automated registration service, and you can Google that to find a little bit more about why you have to turn that off. Create your contact list, including individual calls of other hams that you want on your lookup table, and group calls, which are the top groups. Uh, create a channel, and make sure you give it a frequency, offset, color code, uh, time slot number, and group call to operate on. And then make sure you assign that channel to a zone so you can find it in the radio. Um, <coughs> I mentioned that repeat, uh, if you're trying to program a radio to access a repeater, um, you will transmit, um, when you transmit on the radio um, for the first time and the radio has made communication successfully with the repeater, you'll get what sounds like, a talk. it's called a talk permit tone. And that means that 
establishment, establishment has been made with the repeater, and uh, your radio has been cleared that you have the channel and you're transmitting. Just holding the PTT down, that exchange quickly happens, and then you're good to go. Um, you may receive a busy or access denied tone if the repeater is busy or you're out of range of it. <clears throat> and this is an important thing, difference about operating since we have these internet network radios. Um, that's the Motorola one. <laughs> stick, to, uh, stick to your local channels if you can. If you're operating around here, we have uh, Nova Local um, and statewide has their local, uh, they're actually not statewide, but the other state repeaters. 27500 is the local talk group, and that will go in and stay at the repeater. So talking to your folks driving around town, that's where you want to operate on the local channel. Um, at the next level up, you might use state to make state calls, but there's no point in calling your friend uh, from here, calling your friend you know, in Montgomery County using, um, using like worldwide English or something like that, because everybody in the world's repeater's gonna key up when you go. Um, remember your radio ID is not your call sign. Your, no, your radio is not transmitting N4CV over the air in bits and bytes that are legal. You have to still do that by voice. And then here's some links uh, uh, to, uh, to a, few, a few other places that um, you can find some more information. This amateur radio guide to digital mobile radio is great. W2XAV wrote that and most of everything I said in this presentation is, is somewhere in there in maybe perhaps uh, phrased differently and that makes, may make more sense to you. Um, and then uh, you can use your creativity to think about how to get involved in DMR. Thank you. Thank you.